Welcome to ENT 204, Data-Driven Enterprise, going from vision to value. My name is Tom Godden, and I'm an enterprise strategist with Amazon Web Services. The enterprise strategy team is a team of former CIOs and CTOs, and we spend time with our enterprise clients sharing with them best practices from not only our individual experience in migrating to the cloud, but from the learnings that we get working with many of our customers. I previously was the Chief Information Officer at Foundation Medicine, and I led them on a transformation to go from an on-premise solution all into AWS and to migrate from a waterfall methodology to an agile methodology for FDA Class Three regulated devices. Hello, and my name is Ishit Vajrajani. I'm also an enterprise strategist with AWS. Before I joined AWS, I was the global CTO for the media company a &E Network that owns brands like History Channel. At a and &E, I was privileged to lead the company from a traditional US-centric broadcast business to a global direct-to-consumer digital business powered by cloud and data. Every business wants to unleash the value of data in order to increase agility, drive innovation, and ultimately to improve efficiency. While data is abundant and growing rapidly, just producing it or storing it doesn't automatically create value. Value is realized by creating a culture and an operating model to put that data to use every day so you can invent on behalf of your customers. However, there are numerous cultural challenges in outdated governance models, maybe organizational silos, in use of a legacy execution model that stand in the way of realizing this vision. In this session, we will cover the strategies rooted in firsthand experience of two former CXOs on how to overcome these barriers and turn this vision into a reality. Ishit, this all sounds really exciting, but can you share a little bit more what other customers are doing and how this matters to them and how they're benefiting? Sure, Tom. It's uh, always good to start with a why. Uh, and the way we see it is there are several benefits to becoming a data-driven enterprise that customers are realizing. It is well understood that data helps us make better decisions, but it helps us get to those decisions faster, and speed matters in business. For example, manufacturing company Georgia Pacific uses data and analytics to predict potential equipment failures months in advance. That way they can schedule preventative maintenance and avoid expensive downtime. Data helps us respond better to the unexpected. For example, Rare events like global pandemic are very hard to predict, but data helps us detect early trend, run some experiment, see how we are responding to that and what is the feedback we are getting to pivot as needed. For example, Y Air is a global respiratory care company. When global pandemic hit, they were able to use data analytics to scale ventilator production 20x while improving their production quality and increasing the first pass yield, which is a measure the rate at which the product clears the quality check in the first attempt by 3x. Data also helps us deeply understand our customers and then use that understanding to create amazing customer experiences. For example, Formula One, collects millions of data points in real time during any typical race. They have sensors all around the cars, but sensors on the track. And they combine this real time data with over 70 years of historical data, and then use both of these data sets to train machine learning model to come up with overtake probability or pit strategy and show those things real time to fans watching on TV or from the comfort of their home, bringing them much closer to the action. Data also opens up new opportunities. Data allows us to expand into new market segments and reach new customer segments. For example, Disney Plus has expanded into 59 countries 
since launch using cloud and data with the compelling content that we all love. And data allows us to do this while improving efficiency by finding opportunities for automation and eliminating waste. Since 2015, Amazon.com has reduced the outbound packaging size by 33% using data, AI, and machine learning, eliminating over 915,000 ton of waste. Now that's not just efficient, but it also goes a long way towards achieving the goal of sustainability, where we have committed to reaching net zero carbon by 2040, 10 years ahead of the Paris Climate Accord. And so Tom, those are all the reasons why we do this. It's not so much about just having the data, but really the outcomes that you can get using that data. It's really impressive what a lot of these organizations have been able to accomplish. This here is the Shango bone. It's over 20,000 years old. And if you look closely, you can see the counting marks on it. As it turns out, humans have been arguably using data for over 20,000 years. Maybe you could even argue that this might be the first object storage, although maybe not the most efficient, but good for the time. But what is changing now that's driving all of this? We're creating more useful data than ever. As more of the world's population comes online, and we continue to see growth in mobile devices, as well as expansion in how we buy and consume products and services, the world is becoming increasingly more digital. And as such, there's more and more data. IDC projects that the amount of data created over the next three years will be more data than has been created in the past 30 years. But more importantly than the amount of data that we have, we have an unprecedented amount of opportunities to put that data to use. With the cloud, we can store, process, and analyze massive amounts of data. We can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to solve complex problems and create fast feedback loop with our customers so we can iterate and improve. Let's look at a brief history of how enterprises have used data. What we see is a progression from being just data aware to becoming data informed and finally becoming data driven. If we focus on the top three rows there, what we find is in the 90s, we're really focused on the data. There were static batch reports that took a long time to run and probably were printed out on the green bar. All right, maybe that was the 80s. They were used primarily by executives or department heads to look back and they answer the question, what happened? It was sort of like driving by looking out your rear view mirror. In the 2000s, enterprises started to gain insights with interactive dashboards. The data was available to more power users and more functional experts. However, the data was still siloed between different systems and departments. And this made it really hard to be able to get access to all the data. Data-driven enterprises today use data to guide actions in every aspect of their business. Data is used to not only inform, but with data science, it can be turned into automated actions to improve the business while it's being made available to everyone. What we see here then is this progression of that data-driven enterprise it's one that effectively drives insights from that data and that they use those insights to drive action and ultimate to deliver those outcomes. And Tom, that's a fascinating history. We've been at this for a long time and still we struggle to convert this vision into unleashing the value of data. In fact, majority of the enterprises and leading companies have been investing in data, but they have failed to unleash the value. And that's because of cultural challenges, organizational silos, outdated governance model, as well as old guard technology. So the question is, how do we overcome these challenges to turn this potential and the vision into the reality? Some of the things that we all have heard are 
coming up here. Now, this slide is uh, slightly tongue in cheek. Some of these are not bad ideas, but becoming a data-driven enterprise is a lot more than a series of proclamations or checklist motions. It's not a magic wand. So Tom, if it's not this, let's share based on our experience, what really works? In working with thousands of enterprises, we've been able to identify four key pillars, each with their own guiding principles that helps an organization successfully become data-driven. As is true with many topics that we cover on the enterprise strategy team, the first topic is often culture. A strong culture establishes the beliefs, the values, the behaviors that all other aspects of your transformation are built upon. Without a strong culture, you will struggle. And this culture then has to be supported by an organizational structure that reduces the distance and friction between where the data is and where the decisions are made. As you begin this journey, you will also need to invest in new roles and skills that we will talk about. At Amazon, we love a good mechanism. And that's for good reason. Mechanisms work, especially when we talk about having high quality data with easy access and effective use. We'll dive into best practices around how to put mechanisms to work as your data-driven strategy. And finally, a good strategy without execution is hallucination. So we'll talk about how do you go about executing on this strategy? How do you build the foundation? And what are the tools that are available now to get you started on this journey? Tom, take us through our lessons on culture and organization, and then I'll come back and talk about mechanisms and execution. Great, so let's start with culture. A good principle here is to focus on facts, not feelings. This reminds me of Edward Deming's quote, in God we trust, all others bring data. But that's still not enough. We need to build a culture that empowers people to act and not get lost into battles over fiefdoms. A survey of executives by New Vantage Partners around data and AI taken in 2019 revealed that 95% of the challenges around a successful adoption of a data transformation are cultural. Only 5% are around technology and process. I have to say that's not surprising. It turns out technology is kind of the easy part. You may have seen in a previous presentation of ours that we talked about the four E's of building a data-driven culture. The first E is to engage. You need leadership to engage in supporting and driving visible changes. Their words saying we're kicking off this program, I'm putting my energy behind it are not enough. You need them to go beyond just sponsoring it. They have to be visibly engaged. How they share data, how they make decisions, how they help break down barriers, how they stop using the old report that they've relied on and, and put their energy and effort behind supporting the new data-driven organization. How you operate as an executive team sends a much stronger message than what you say. The second E is to enable. You need to enable frontline action using data. We hear a lot of organizations proclaiming data democratization, but that's just not enough to democratize the data. You need to democratize actions being able to be taken on that data as well. You need to change the culture that is used, that used to require you to take a decision all the way up, higher in the organization so the decision could be made and instead empower the people who are closest to your customers, who are closest to the data, to be able to take informed actions based upon that data. And I think it goes a little bit without saying, but in order to really get people to use the data, Make it not only easy, but enjoyable. No one likes to have to struggle through the reports or you know long drill downs and dashboards. Make it easy. 
The consumerization of IT is raising people's expectations, not only with their personal use, but in their professional use as well. The third E is to educate. You need to treat data proficiency as a core skill for the whole company and invest as such. This means don't just do a few data literacy programs for a few people. You need to build common definitions, vocabularies, create ways to increase that data proficiency. Invest in training your people. Show your commitment and the value you place on this data transformation by supporting the career growth and development of your staff in this area. And the last E is to eliminate. Eliminate cultural and departmental silos that really are built up over antiquated practices. Move from treating data just a departmental property to treating it as an organizational asset. A high-performing, data-driven organization will share ideas across silos. It will share behaviors and best practices. It will share learnings. We talk a lot about building organizations that drive accountability, but also empower teams to be able to act. This is done partially by eliminating those roadblocks and those silos. So here we see the four E's of building that data-driven culture. You may have heard that Amazon uses six-page written narratives instead of PowerPoints for any new idea, change, or key decision that we make. However, there's a very peculiar Amazonian way that is part of our culture on how we write these narratives that forces us to be objective and data-driven. We don't just use adjectives and superlatives that are open to interpretation. We call those weasel words and they are not allowed. Instead, we state facts and we use data. Instead of saying, we gained more customers this quarter, we say, we gained 100 new customers in Q4 2021 compared to 75 in Q3 2021. Instead of saying, we improved performance significantly, we say we reduced our page load times by 20%. As part of our culture, we value the precision of data, and we value using the data to make decisions. But it's important to know a data-driven culture doesn't just blindly follow data or allow analysis paralysis to slow down the progress. One of our leadership principles at Amazon is a bias for action, which states speed matters in business. Many decisions and actions are reversible, and you do not need extensive study we value calculated risk taking. So how do we decide when it's appropriate to move quickly? Well, one helpful mental model that we've developed is to think of it as, well, is this a one-way door or a two-way door? One-way doors have significant, irrevocable consequences, and they need deep analysis, maybe such as building a fulfillment center or a data center. Two-way door decisions, which by the way, are most decisions, have limited and reversible consequences, maybe such as experimenting with a new feature on a mobile shopping app. When we see a two-way door, and we have enough evidence and reason to believe going through it would be a good idea, we just walk through it. Either way, we've learned a valuable lesson. We've learned that this idea works and we can launch it and scale it. Or we learned it doesn't work and we can factor that into our design and decision-making to come up with another idea to try out. We teach leaders at Amazon, you should make decisions when you feel that you have about 70% of the data that you wish you had. If you wait for 90%, you've probably been waiting too long. The second pillar of becoming a data-driven enterprise is organization. We see successful organizations building models that emphasize organizational agility rather than the traditional command and control approach. The old adage is true here, what got you here will not get you to where you need to go. As you will appreciate, data does not recognize the arbitrary organizational structures originally designed for the factory worker 200 years ago, or one made up of layers and broad spans of control and lots of authorization levels. Organizational silos are a massive impediment to scaling the impact and the use of data. They're not agile, they're cumbersome, 
They often assume that the people higher up in the organization are more knowledgeable than those who are actually experiencing the problem, those who are closer to the customer. Instead, we see the most effective teams are similar to those used in companies that are digitally transforming. They use autonomous, cross-functional teams that are given a business problem to solve, but also the latitude, skills, and support to be able to solve it. They are accountable and they are empowered. They're intimately familiar with the customer in the problem space. Ownership is clear and impediments are reduced, thus increasing velocity. These cross-functional autonomous teams, ownership of the problem extends from ideation through design, development, test, into releasing, operating, and supporting. Another interesting thing happens with this organizational design. Typically, your overall culture and morale of your team improves. The teams feel trusted. They feel empowered. They spend more time solving problems and delighting customers than asking for permission and coordinating work. We also see a modern data community organization working very effectively across the enterprise. This modern data community, again, pushes the agility to the edge of the business where it's closest to the customers. Based upon our own experience with the Amazon Marketplace, where we have thousands of developers working with thousands of data sources on over 100 petabytes of data, we've discovered several best practices around creating this data marketplace where data can be discovered transparently, used with established rules, security, and commitments that follow from the owners of the data. This allows a company to operate both in an agile and in a secure way. This marketplace consists of three primary roles, the data marketplace team, the data producer, and the data consumer. The data marketplace team is responsible for managing the tools and technology used to support the marketplace, as well as establishing the governing policies and onboarding new users into the marketplace. The data producer generally knows the domain of the data the best. They understand the intent of how the data should be used. In this model, they own the data and the governance around the data. They are responsible for granting access to the data. The data consumer is the user of the data. They understand and execute the business priorities and the creation of new insights based upon that data using sophisticated analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. That marketplace creates a decentralized environment where users can search, discover, request new access, publish new data, create new data pipelines, and really understand the data quality and lineage behind these diverse data assets. But to do all of this, it requires the development of a few new skills. If we think beyond the organizational structure, we need to think about how do we enable this. And the first thing is by enabling a single threaded leader. I can't stress the importance of this enough, especially when you are starting out. The single threaded leader could be your chief data officer, but it doesn't have to be. But it is important that it is someone who is senior, well-respected and empowered to drive change. We all have day jobs and those day jobs will hold that transformation back. It's key that this single threaded leader is single threaded and solely focused on this data driven transformation. The second aspect is you need to invest in storytellers and get good at telling a story. Stories are memorable. Stories are how we learn. Stories is how we drive change. I'm willing to bet you remember a meme that you saw on social media more this week than the memo you read last week. At the end of the day, we want to use data to help us make better decisions. But first, we must acknowledge that numbers alone are not meaningful to us. If I tell you the simple statement, mm, 25, that's the number, you'll have no idea if that means 25% is the fraction of the day that I spend working the percentage of my friends who root for my favorite football team, maybe the number of tacos I eat in a week or the number of pounds I need to lose from eating all those tacos. Numbers and data need to be put into context for us to understand. Stories is how we can help 
help numbers make sense, not only to ourselves, but to others. Make those stories clear and relevant. Don't use jargon. Use good data. And like we do at Amazon, we work backwards from the problem. Understand what the clear objective is of the report that you're creating. Telling a story with data will help your team get from point A, where they currently are, to be able, because they understand the context, to get to point B, where they will have that aha moment and change everything. Critical to success, we found people who are able to see end-to-end -end across the business process key to success. These are people who are typically your former SMEs, but they also need to be more than that. They need to be someone who is not solely focused on one specific area, where they were the subject matter expert, but they need to understand the impact and the breadth of that entire area completely so they can put the information into context. Without this role, you'll reinforce silos and likely have a suboptimal solution. Next, you need to invest in developing those rare roles, those unicorns that connect the art and science of business by connecting the dots across the functions. These are people who are typically your product managers, maybe they're located in IT, who act as connectors between the organizational functions. Ideally, as your organization matures, it will become less dependent on the types of these roles. Lastly, you need to develop and encourage domain experts to take on the role of helping and educating others. You see, people enjoy being valuable. They enjoy being the expert. Allow these people who used to hold on to their data be those experts who are able then to share how people should use it, how important and valuable their data is, instead of just having them protecting it and isolating it. Have them take an active role in that data. Ishit, these are just a couple of areas I'm, I'm interested to hear you dive in a little bit more and cover some of the next topics around um, mechanisms you know, that are really key pillars to being successful. Thank you, Tom, uh, for sharing those lessons across culture and organization. Let's now talk about mechanisms. Mechanism is a complete process that allows leaders to scale beyond their line of sight. Mechanisms allow good intentions, like, hey, we want to become a data-driven enterprise into real measurable business outcomes. And so when it comes to mechanisms to become a data-driven enterprise, we'll talk about three things. Number one is measurement. As the popular saying goes, what gets measured gets done. But is it really that simple? We will find out. Second, we'll talk about governance. How do you govern data to make sure that you have safe, compliant, but yet easy access to data available to everyone that needs it? And then finally, we'll talk about data quality. Something that is often forgotten or left till the end when it's too late. And so we'll talk about how do you set mechanisms to avoid that. Let's start with measurements. When it comes to measurement and goals, sometimes leaders have the tendency to define goals for everything that we do. In fact, it's also misunderstood that a data-driven enterprise simply sets KPIs and goals and measures everything. But as we know, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. So we need to be really disciplined about what we measure and why are we measuring it. Sometimes organizations have a tendency to assume measures into fixed targets and start to optimize based on those, creating some unintended consequences. Let me tell you a story. It's a fable about a nail factory uh, there was a nail factory and owner one day comes and says, I'm going to measure you at the end of the day on number of nails that you produce. She comes back at the end of the day and sees 
that there are thousands and thousands of really, really tiny nails produced. That's true to the measure that she set, but entirely useless. So she said, you know what, this didn't work. I'm going to do something different. I'm now going to measure you based on the weight of the nails produced. And so she goes back and then comes again next day to find that a giant nail weighing tons has been produced. Once again, true to the measure, but equally useless. And that is the essence of Goodhart's law. Measures should be used to steer course correct and assess, not as a fixed target. Data-driven organizations know what vocabulary to use when it comes to measurement versus targets. They avoid the mindset of achievement of fixed, fixed target, but rather go into continuous improvement and use measures to drive those improvement. Take an example of organizations on the left. Organizations on the left, they think in absolutes. A project takes 18 months to complete, costs 20 headcounts and $2 million, cost of a server is $100,000. Those are all absolute numbers. A data-driven organization, on the other hand, thinks in relatives. They speak about burn rate. How much does a project cost to run every month? They talk about velocity. How many features can I deliver in this sprint? And the server for them does not cost $100,000, but the compute cost is $1.50 per hour. And this difference gives you an idea as to why virtually all data-driven organizations that are on the right operate in the cloud. Because cloud enables this vocabulary by moving through the consumption-based model, giving you the speed and agility that all data-driven organizations need. When it comes to measurement, the second thing that we need to watch out for are watermelon goals. What is a watermelon goal? Well, watermelon is green on the outside, but red in the inside. So these are the goals that are green in the letter, but red in the spirit. Let's take an example. Say you have a digital product or a service, and you set the goal as improving retention rate. And you really obsess over that goal and incentivize increasing the retention rate. Well, one way to do that is to hide the cancel button and instead make your customers call 1-800-I-CANCEL or whatever the cancellation number is and then have them go through seven, eight different options before they can talk to a human who can help them cancel the service. In the short run, your retention rates might improve, but it's a terrible customer experience. The way leaders can avoid this behavior is by always thinking about and setting balancing measures. For example, in this case, along with the retention rate, if we also measure engagement rate or customer satisfaction score, that would prevent the behavior like hiding that cancel button. And there are many such examples of using balancing measures to make sure that we holistically optimizing the whole rather than the parts. For example, if you're launching a brand new business, your customer acquisition cost might be higher, but you can balance that against the lifetime value that you expect over the long run. You can avoid optimization in silo by just not looking at click-through rates because maybe your click-through rates are great because you have an amazing marketing funnel. But then the sign-up process to sign up for your service is terrible. And that's why your conversion rates are not improving. And so balancing click-through rate against conversion rate will actually give you an idea about the whole process rather than just a part of it. So pick balancing measures to avoid watermelon goals. Let's now talk about governance. Done right, a good governance framework 
accelerates your journey to become a data-driven enterprise. But if you're not careful, it can also be one of the biggest hindrance in the roadblock that slows you down. The goal of governance should be to enable safe and compliant access to data, not create hurdle and slow down the progress. But how do we do that? In our experience, it's important to start with guiding principles or tenets. The cross-functional team that Tom talked about earlier, from representation from security and compliance and producers and consumers of data, should come together and put together what are the tenets and guiding principles for our governance framework before you go and produce long policies and procedure documents. Because these tenets provide direction. These tenets enable autonomy within an overarching framework. And tenets avoid teams from getting engaged into philosophical debate that slow down progress once again. Here are some examples of good tenants that we have seen. Once again, this is just a representative list. Your tenants may look different based on your goals. But as you will notice in these tenants, they provide a clear direction, but don't always exactly tell you the path to get there. And that's intentional. The role of the tenant is to help you choose. There's also a healthy tension between those tenants. And once again, that's intentional because you don't want to optimize in a single direction. So tenants help you set those guardrails for your governance framework. So use tenant. The second part of a governance framework and an effective governance framework is to unify and centralize implementation, but decentralize decisions around those controls. What I mean by that is to enable business analysts, data scientists, and developers to get access to data that you need while maintaining security, privacy, compliance, and the trust that customers have put in you by giving you their data. You can employ an approach like Lakehouse, using tools like AWS Lake Formation, which also includes a data catalog where it scans and tags and makes all of that information available to you. Allowing you to provide fine grain access, set auditing control in one place, while pushing down the action and responsibility and enabling innovation on the edge, giving you both satisfaction and comfort and confidence in your control, but also agility to the organization that you need. The third piece, when you talk about data catalog, is that a good data catalog resides on good metadata. Now your security, privacy, and compliance regulations will continue to change. If you have good data catalog powered by good metadata, it will allow you to respond in an agile fashion when that happens. And so that you don't have to go back and redo everything because you have strong data lineage. You know where the data is coming from, where the data is going, and what are the key attributes of that data set allowing you to manage it much, much better. The fourth part is automation. Like with everything else in the cloud, automation allows you accuracy, consistency, and agility. Automate everything from provisioning to access control to auditing, pretty much anything that you have to do often and has a potential to create friction. Automate your bureaucracy. And this goes without saying, but the final one is encrypt everything. Encrypt data at rest, encrypt data at tran in transit. This is one of the key things that you can do for a solid governance framework. So use some of these principles to set your governance foundation. Let's talk about data quality now. And when it comes to data quality, the quote that I like is from Adrian Sane. It goes something like this, data is like water. Ignore its quality and fear indigestion. And this is really true for data quality because it's often forgotten 
and left till the end when it's too late and when you're actually planning to use data to build analytical model or put it to the use for machine learning. Build data quality in throughout your process. And the way to do that is to start at the source. Incentivize right data quality at the source by driving education in data producers and explaining them what is the downstream impact of good data quality? How is this being used? What is the impact of this data? And why is it important to get this data right in the first place? And the way to do that is also to reduce what you ask for, especially from those business workflows that, are, that require manual data entry. Less is more because the focus should be on the quality here. So don't ask for everything, ask for really what you're going to need. And then once again, automation is our friend here. Automate all inferential data like addresses, zip codes, past order history, customer support calls, anything that you can bring on your own and integrate, automate that. Also automate data validations and checks so that there is visibility upfront at the source of how you're progressing when it comes to maintaining and managing right data quality. And when you do that, it creates this virtuous cycle because better data results in better insights. Better insights means you will take better actions. And if you take better actions, you get better outcomes, which gives you more data and more freedom to run more experiments. So focusing on data quality helps you set this virtual cycles, virtuous cycle in motion. Second thing when it comes to data quality is to put it in the context of how you're going to use. Be pragmatic about data quality. It is not all or nothing. Sometimes debates about data quality can become really hot button issues, but be practical about how you're going to use it. For example, if you're using data for financial reporting or compliance related use cases, well, then there is a different acceptance criteria of the quality. But if you're using data for running some A-B test, for picking maybe a few different menu options for your websites or your, your app, decisions that are two-way door decisions that Tom spoke about, then the acceptance criteria for that and the impact for that is different. So use the context in how you're going to use the data. And then use mechanisms to score this. Come up with weighted numbers on the type of data set, the usage of that data set, the impact, how many validations check that you have run to, to assign a score and a number and use traffic lights on your data catalog to be very transparent about what the consumers of this data set are dealing with. And once again, you can set automated rules. For example, if it is yellow and only 65%, well, it's okay to run some experiment, but the data pipeline will not allow you to take it beyond to production. So put data quality in the context. That brings us to execution. And when it comes to execution, the key is to be nimble and agile. Think big, but start small. And this is not something that we've always been able to do. And the reason we took the approach traditionally was the tools that we were dealing with. They were pretty unforgiving. And so we spent a lot of time defining and designing different data formats and reference data architecture and indexes and how everything connects because it was very, very hard to go back and change. And so we spent 18 months, 24 months building the foundation. Then we spent a few more weeks and months in governance and business processes. Then we came up with use cases and finally, after a really long cycle time, we got some business value. What cloud has done is allow us to flip this pyramid where time to value can truly be reduced, where we start with the use case and then work backward from there, incrementally building foundation, 
reducing time to value. And when you build it this way, the incremental delivery also means that you already have data sets that you brought in your foundation, which can open up possibilities to answer new questions or better questions. Let me take an example of simple profit and loss reporting, a PNL. To run a PNL, you need how you make money, that's your revenue, and where you spend money, that's your cost. Well, once you have the revenue and cost, you can get some PNL and some other finance and accounting related use cases. But now it suddenly opens up possibilities to answer and go after some other use cases in sales, maybe text and planning and operation, because some of these functions are also interested in some intersection and interplay of revenue and cost. Next, say you want to go after marketing and supply chain. You want to assess your campaign performance uh, in marketing, or you want to reduce lead time by deriving better insights in your supply chain. For that, you need revenue and cost data, which you already have because of other use cases, but you then need to bring, say, consumer information and some inventory data, which helps you solve marketing and supply chain, but opens up new possibilities to maybe improve customer support and customer support experience, or look at inventory and see how you can forecast better inventory because now you have inventory and the cost data. The point here is to think about this as those pieces of puzzles where you have a target picture. And then when you put few pieces together, the final picture becomes clearer and your time to get to that puzzle to finish will reduce. They constantly reducing the time to market. Data lake will be a big part of your execution, but beware of building a data lake to nowhere. A lake without boat slips, beach, ramp might be beautiful to look at, but it's uh, not something that is very useful. It's the same thing with a data lake. And to avoid building a data lake to nowhere, focus on capturing the right data, not just consuming it. What I mean by this is there are many transactions that still happen on the back of the napkin or in some spreadsheet within your company. Have a strong application and integration strategy. Because as we know, data ages like wine, while applications like fish. So make sure your applications and integration don't stink because otherwise your data-driven journey will be stalled. Focus on bringing those transactions and workflows inside of applications and product. The next is integrate data in the core product and put it in the context of the workflow. So instead of making your consumers go somewhere else, move outside of their transactional system, then use data and come back, put that data in the core part of their workflow and the system that they use every single day. For example, if a salesperson is in the field, make data that they need available in their context. If there is a shop floor or a production line, make sure that the operator has the data they need in the context of their core transactional products. And finally, use right tool for the right job. The time to use old guard databases was last century. We are in the time where cloud has allowed us access to modern tools and finding right tool for the right job to your builder. Because a modern tool set really allows you flexibility to get the best of both worlds, data lake as well as purpose-built data stores. It allows you to store data in an open standard format, reducing cost as well as time to value. And when it comes to this modern tool set, AWS has the broadest and deepest set of data and analytics services. In Amazon S3, you have a data lake that you can build with unmatched scalability, durability, and price performance. When it comes to database engines, the choice is not limited to just relational databases. If that's the right 
use case and the right tool for the job that you want to that you want to achieve, then go for it. But otherwise, you also have key value pair, time series, document, ledger, and many different purpose-built databases available to give your builders choices. And then you have integration with AI and machine learning services, as well as analytic services like Redshift to accelerate time to value. And all of this, as we talked about, can be managed through AWS Lake Formation, giving you better governance and control from one central place. So use the right tool for the right job. Let's talk about getting started because well begun is half done. And when, when it comes to your data-driven journey, it's important to not start with the data, but with the customer or business outcome that you're trying to achieve. So start with the business outcome. And what I mean by that is identify a few impactful, visible, and relatable use cases to start with. Now I use those words deliberately here. When you're starting out, don't pick something that is just nice to have and nobody cares about. Pick use cases that truly matters to your business because the success in these use cases or early part of your journey will help you build momentum that will propel your data-driven journey forward. And then pick something that is relatable and visible, things that rest of the organization can get behind. Once you do that, build out a strong hypothesis. You may realize at the end of running your analytics and using some data that you have to change that, or maybe you were wrong but it's good to build out a hypothesis to start with when you're running experiments. And then use some of the 4E framework that we are, talked about earlier to build the team and start to change that culture. Use cloud to incrementally build the foundation of data and derive those insights. And then make sure that you're enabling that frontline action because that's the action that will give you the feedback and data which you can use to improve the definition of your experiments, find maybe new or better opportunities to continue to build your data flywheel. So in summary, we have talked about our lessons as two former CXOs, but also what we learn from many other customers around culture, organization, mechanisms and executions. These are some of the guiding principles. Journey to become a data-driven enterprise is really exciting and fun. It can seem daunting, but you don't have to do it all alone. We are here to help. If you need a senior executive to, as a sparring partner or need peer level guidance or want to inspire your team, our teams of former CXOs from Enterprise Strategies is here to help. If you need help putting together your data strategy and identifying right use cases so that you can mobilize and scale, then we have AWS Data Driven Everything program. If you already know the use cases that you want to go after, but need help building the pilot and actually putting together the architecture, then we have AWS Data Lab program where you can come with an idea and leave with a solution. And there are a number of other ways that we can help. So don't hesitate to ask. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful rest of the reInvent. And please feel free to reach out if there are any questions. Thank you.